Okay, hello everyone. Tonight we're going to talk about music. Certain music materials can be handled by a generalist. That's, that is someone who doesn't have a specialization in music or any knowledge of music. And that, those pertain mostly to recorded sound. You know what CDs are, <laughs> you know what streaming music is, and you know the basic genres of music, whether it be music you like to listen to or music that you know other people like to listen to, music you hear on the radio, you see in stores. But when we start getting, getting into printed music, sheet music, scores, and things like that, then we're getting into stuff that is a little bit more specialized. So it's very rare that you would find a music library or a library collection that specializes in music materials where the person doesn't have an extensive background in music. And many of those kinds of organizations require that you have a master's level degree in music, either in music history, music performance, music composition, because it is very, again, it's very specialized material, especially if you're in a position of doing any kind of cataloging or any kind of acquisition. You've probably seen sheet music, you know, the, whatever the latest pop song is, they've got some piano part out there, or when your parents forced you to take piano lessons when you were eight years old, you know, you can remember playing some, something by the Beatles on piano, but musical scores and more extensive musical works are an entirely different animal. And there are specialized places that we go to get these kinds of materials, and then there are specialized ways in which we have to um, store and make these kinds of things available. The other thing about music is it's one of those categories of materials that don't fall neatly under the copyright exceptions that we have for most other library materials. So um, we'll talk a little bit about the problems that that causes. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus really on more specialized music material in case you ever find. Now, you may never work with a music collection in your life, but you should know at least enough about it to recognize that if some donor gives you a collection and within that collection is a lot of music-related material, at least being able to recognize that, hey, Maybe this is a special collection type material. Maybe I should talk to somebody else about. The majority of you who go into public environments are probably just going to be dealing with popular stuff. okay? Or maybe a, an historical collection of sheet music, songs from the early part of the century. And you've probably seen some big digitization projects, digitization of sheet music. And certainly, we're dealing with digitization of actual performances of different songs and different works. So that's what most everyone will be dealing with. But there are a few of you who may find yourselves suddenly in charge of this special collection, that donations of papers by some local musician. And, and so um, just be able to recognize a little bit about the format, what you can and cannot do with it. So again, we return to what we always have to consider when we're looking at new formats, the nature of the information, the nature of our users, the nature of our organization. And of course, we're going to focus in here on this. But before we can get going into the nature of the information, we still have to look at the nature of our users, especially with this format, because we have different categories of users for music materials. There are different levels of music use, different, even when it comes to recorded music, even when it comes to sound recordings. Certainly, there are different levels of use when it comes to sheet music or any kind of printed music. So most of you are familiar with casual users of music. OK, these are people who use music for recreational purposes, you like to listen to it, or maybe you're putting together a mashup for somebody's wedding, or you're putting together a, a mixed disc that you can use in the car, or you know, just look at what's on your iPod or your phone, and that mixture of different genres. Again, casual users of music. And there may be people who play with the town band, sing in the choir, play organ at church, or just play music for your own enjoyment. Okay, so these are, but these are people who are not basing their livelihood on, on music. It's really more of a recreational information use. And there are different kinds of collections that will support casual users of music. Printed music usually falls under popular songs, songbooks, 
And then we have recorded music for casual users of music, and these are popular classical CDs, things you find on iTunes, streaming media, and sometimes performing arts type DVDs, um, river dance, various musicals, various performances. And then there are digital resources. Streaming media that you would get via a platform like Overdrive. If anyone's ever used Overdrive in a public library, you see that in addition to ebooks, there are also there's also music on there, whole albums as well as individual songs. And then things like iTunes and other collections of MP3s of, of different musical works. The second category of users you have are the professionals, the people who make their livelihood off of music. And this would be professional musicians, so performers, as well as music teachers, and people who do research in the areas of music, musicologists, composers, people who look at music, using music in therapy. And so when your users fall into this category, you're going to be dealing with a collection that has far more coverage in terms of breadth and depth. So you're going to collect things like full scores, full ensemble works, as well as solo works and works for bands and orchestras. You might even find you're working at a broadcasting or production company. So you might be working at a production company that produces the music for movies, or a radio station like WNED, our public radio classical station here is always putting out ads for interns to come in and work in their music library. And that involves having to research the works that are on their playlists. Because you've got to pro provide background material to the DJs who introduce the works. And you know, you're talking works that will last a half an hour. So then they talk for a half an hour about what you just listened to. So there's got to be a lot of detail in there. So it involves research, not only of the music itself, but a lot of this background information, like the orchestras, and who is the conductor, and when was it performed, and maybe a little bit about the composer, and when he wrote this piece, and what was going on in his life. And if you ever listen to classical radio, all that kind of information has to come from so somewhere. Those DJs don't know everything. So you might be working in a library where you have to do that kind of research. And the collections that we use to support professional musicians, teachers, and researchers is also the same. It falls in the category of printed music, recorded music, and then digital resources. It's just the content of, of those categories. It's a little bit more in depth. Well, in some cases, it's a lot more in depth. In many cases, you're dealing with special collections of 15th century, 15th or 16th century scores written on you know, vellum or parchment, um, and very valuable. So this music t t uh, tends to be performance focused. And it, it doesn't just contain the, the piano part for a particular work, but it includes the parts for every in instrument in the orchestra, as well as a full score for the conductor. It may also contain works designed for soloists to play. Um, or duets, or quartets, or quintets. Okay, so it includes it's more than just ba the basic melody and some harmony that you might find in a piano piece. When you do find piano works, of course, they're quite involved as well. Um, not something that you're going to see an average five-year-old playing, um, unless they're like really incredibly talented five-year-olds. The recorded music is going to be what they, cons what they consider to be the standard type of classical works. Um, classical music is actually a, an improper term to use. We group all hoity-toity stuff under the term classical music, but classical music really applies to just a certain period of time in music. There's also Baroque music, and I can't th think of the others right now. And this recorded music will be performances by whole groups. Uh, performances by soloists with groups. And there are certain things that are important. Um, you know, no one conductor is the same. So having a recording of the Berlin Philharmonic with Sir George Solti, that's a far more important performance than, say, something by uh, the Hamburg High School Band or something like that. You know, um, 
So there is, there is a kind of a pecking order in terms of quality and fame um, with classical music, just like there is with any other genre of music. Besides the, the CDs of recorded music, you'll also find some DVDs of ballets and, again, musicals and Broadway performances, operas. And there you get into even more than just the music. You get into the production. And so you know, if you're at a, a college that has a fine arts department and a really well-known fine arts department, or a public library in a city that has a, a really incredible fine arts scene, then you're going to have stuff like this, OK? Playbills to the theater, all your theater offerings. You might have an archive of that kind of thing. And then, of course, um, digital resources. One of the most popular you find with this music of this type is Naxos, uh, which we do have a subscription to here through UB. But you'll also see, especially in the area of academic libraries, but also some uh, large public libraries, local digitization of resources. For instance, we have a, a music department here, but there's a, actually a research center affiliated with the music department involved with new music. Now, new music is one of those things you either like it or you don't. It's usually kind of avant-garde, off the wall. And because we have uh, a new music center here and we have a big conference in June, our music library has the archives for that big conference and also for the music department. So it has recordings of all the performances that have occurred at UB. And those performances are recorded in everything but from reel to reel tape up to digital recordings. And, and the music archives, uh, which is part of the libraries, is responsible for taking care of all that stuff. Okay, so you might find yourself working with actual music performers, handling their performances, recordings of their performances, trying to preserve the history of that ensemble. If you find yourself as a librarian for an orchestra, not only are you acquiring the music, but you're doing markup on the music, and depending upon the conductor, there are certain changes that each conductor makes to a musical work depending upon their interpretation. So again, here's an area where having that background, that disciplinary background in music is important. Some examples of collections. Take a look at the San Jose Public Library site. This gives you a breakdown. And this is you know typical large public library. It has a choral music collection, sheet music for different voice ranges, 17,000 titles. That's pretty extensive. A magazine music collection, bound volumes of sheet music magazine and sing out, which are really more popular, general use kinds of materials. There's a sheet music collection of popular songs from the late 19th century through the 1960s, 18,000 titles. A song and songbook collection, emphasizing popular music from the 1970s on presently includes over 500 songbooks with over 22,000 titles in them. And then it has their stock music collection, which are donated, a donated work of big band music. Okay, so this is a large public library, and it's not unusual in a large urban public library to, have see, to find collections like that, because people are cleaning things out, they go to estate sales, or they don't want the music going into the estate sale. They want to donate it to somebody. And it usually ends up at the local public library. The New York Public Library, which is a research library, when we think of it as a public library, has a really extensive music collection. But think about it. Where is it? New York, Broadway, Rockefeller Arts Center. You've got everything going on in New York when it comes to music. So it has a whole selection. First of all, it has its own branch, Library for the Performing Arts. It has an archive of different musicians' papers that have been donated to it over the years. The Rogers and Hammerstein archives of recorded sound. 700,000 recordings, more than 100,000 printed items. Virtually every format developed for recorded sound. Wax cylinders, acetate, aluminum discs, magnetic wire recordings. That would be really cool to play with. As well as literature, speeches, moving images, 
Um, I know that they have um, presidential speeches in that collection. The theater on film and tape archive, theatrical productions and documented music contributions, video recordings of Broadway, off-Broadway, and regional theater productions, and dialogues between notable theater personnel. You know, this is a really rich collection for someone who does research in this area but also who, for people who are really interested in this kind of stuff. It may not be their life, but, you know, wow, you know, I love the ballet or I love Broadway. It has its own circulating music collection, what we think of traditionally. Um, you can check out sheet music, you can check out CDs and recordings, popular works as well as, as, well as the standards and classical works. It also has full orchestra collections, choral operatics, solo vocal works, 2,000 works in the standard orchestral repertoire. It has a music CD collection, spoken word CD collection, as well as downloadable music. These three are usually what you're going to find in most public libraries, more medium to small public libraries. But obviously, New York Public has you know, a, a really extensive collection. Cleveland Public, popular music collection, over 40,000 CDs. It has a sound effects library collection. Remember, recorded sound is more than just music. So these are royalty-free sound effects on CD. If you're an amateur filmmaker, or you're doing production for the local radio station, or you're coming up with and you're making um, advertisements for radio or TV, you have the sound effects on CD. It has music videos, a thousand titles ranging from concerts, music videos, and artists' profiles. I know they don't play music videos on TV anymore, so you've got to go someplace to find them. Of course, I'm dating myself when I say that. You've probably seen this if you've used um, your local public library. And you'll see that in addition to all these ebooks, you can get audiobooks. And you can get music, all sorts of different genre of music that you can borrow through this system. And there are different classical music, country, electronica, folk, gospel and hip hop, and RB, instrumental, etc. Okay, and so you can go in and you can borrow these, and, and you borrow them just like you would borrow an ebook. You don't get to keep the music. You know, there's an you have it for a certain period of time, and then it disappears from your device, depending on the digital rights management that's used. But this is great to, you know, to be able to go into something like this, listen to the music before you decide if you're going to go out and buy it. You know, if you really like it, you can go out to the store and buy it, but then, or go online to iTunes and buy it, but it's nice, nice to know if you're really going to like it especially if you're, you know, purchasing a whole album. So this kind of streaming media is what you'll find at most public libraries that offer streaming media. You know, how do you get this stuff? How do you get this stuff into, into your library? Um, we're going to move on away from the users now and, and into the content that we find in music collections. First, we have printed music, then we'll talk about recorded sound. And by, by recorded sound, I'm going to stick with music, musical or music-related recorded sound. There are also audiobooks, but audiobooks really form, fall more under the book genre. It's just the medium. You know, you have to pay attention to the medium, whether it's CD, cassette tape, streamed media, etc., just as you would with music. But with printed music, it's very, very hard to find copies of popular works. It's not an industry that's very lucrative right now. Now, you could go to a music store, but there aren't huge publishers that put out printed music, especially since we now have downloadable printed music. Creators of music are licensing their works to online sites, which then allow people to download the music as PDFs, and they can choose what level of music they want, whether it's beginner, intermediate, um, professional. And for like 
they can download and print out their own copy of sheet music. So the printed music market, at least in the United States, has pretty much dried up in terms of go-to publishers uh, when it comes to popular stuff. There are still resources out there where you can get printed music that's geared more towards uh, professional users. But when it comes to the popular stuff, um, it really is hard to find individual printed copies of public, uh, publisher works. Instead, they license, the publishers will license the rights to individual songs for the creation of what they call folios. So they will license the rights to publishers who will create songbooks. Um, you know, the Beatles songbook, celebrity folios, these are called, related to specific artists, um, matching folios, they're folios that come out, songbooks that come out to coincide with an album release or the sheet music that accompanies the soundtrack, released at the same time as the soundtrack was. Concept folios that focus on a theme, love songs of the 90s or favorite piano songs. And again, the publishers license individual songs to the distributors who then put them together and publish them together into a big songbook or a folio. Uh, and then there are mixed folio songs by different composers, popularized by different artists, and revolving around different kinds of themes. As I mentioned, publishers may also license to the print-on-demand sites, musicnotes.com is, is a pretty popular one. And if you go into that site, you can see all of the different kinds of options that are available to you. Those sites are provided a license to make those musical works available. And they negotiate that license with the publisher of the music. And then you become the owner of the copy that you print out. Once you print it out once, you can't print it again. That's the digital rights management that runs through a site like this. That's what the license requires them to only allow a customer to be able to print once. Okay, and it's not like you can download the file to your computer. You have to print it from their site. So there's a certain amount of restriction in how many times you can access and print. And once you print it, you can't access it again. So you hope you've got ink in your printer and that the printer is working. Otherwise, you might find you're going to have to pay for it again. When it comes to performance music, there are specific kinds of publishers called concert music publishers. Whereas there aren't many here in the United States, there's still quite a few in Europe. Because when it comes to this kind of music, Europe has an entirely different attitude. You know, they put conductors up on pedestals like rock stars. Um, and that's just the tradition. So there are still quite a few publishers in Europe that you can get music associated with symphony orchestras, opera, ballet, chamber ensembles, new variations of music, of classic works that are modified for different levels. You know, you don't want your beginning piano student playing a Mozart piece the way Mozart originally wrote it, because they're going to cry when they see the notation. But you would like them to at least play the right hand or the left hand, the tune and the basic harmony. Solo and instructional material for solo instruments and, and voice. New compositions by what we term to be serious composers. And then composer collected his and historical works. Things that are meant for historical studies. Entire repertoires that come from a specific composer or a specific publisher or maybe even a collector of music. There are also educational music publishers, and these are the kinds of publishers that we go to when we're teaching music in a K-12 through school, and we've got to find the right music for the spring band concert or the Christmas orchestra concert. There are also specialty publishers, and these are publishers that focus on a certain composer, focus on a specific type of ensemble. They may focus on a specific in instrument. They, may, they might be a publisher emanating out of a professional society, you know, the National Association of Tuba Players, or something like that. They could also be publications that come out of artist-run organizations. 
Um, there are quite a few of independent artist groups that have collaborated to produce their own music, to publish their own music because they don't want to deal with big corporate publishers. So they handle all of the production and um, distribution on their own. Then we have digital sheet music to refer to all printed music that has been digitized in some way. We have two kinds of digital sheet music that are available. Uh, sheet music that is digitized by a library or an organization. It is your locally owned collection. It's usually material that's in the public domain, so there aren't any copyright issues, or it's something that your organization holds the copyright to. So here are here's some good examples. The Library of Congress has an incredible uh, collection. You can look at the images um, of the uh, pages in this sheet music. It's just a really fantastic um, digital collection. And you can print this music as well. But it's also, it's all uh, music that was actually donated, um, not donated, but it was turned in to the the Library of Congress because at one time anything that you were uh, copywriting you had to deposit a copy with the Library of Congress so it has all of the sheet music that has since fallen into the public domain it's gone through the process of, of actually digitizing that sheet music to make it available and one of the interesting things about this sheet music is not just the music itself but the cover art on it there's some truly offensive things on some of that co cover art, things that we would not, would not be socially acceptable today. Uh, but when you think of the time period in which they were created, there's a whole school of music research that looks at cover art and, and representations on cover art. This is, a more, this is a, also a digital sheet music collection with a more um, international focus. So it tries to pull in public domain works from all sorts all over the world. So this is another digital collection that you can turn to. There's also digital sheet music that I mentioned already that uh, uh, you can get through a commercial site like um, Music Notes or Sheet Music Plus. Both of those are very reputable sites where a lot of people get their music. But we can't offer that kind of service through a library. There are no databases out there of commercial publications. I think in part because people can buy the music so, uh, so cheaply. And to my knowledge, the types of vendors that do have the licenses to provide access to sheet music, you know, they don't have any kind of database set up or library program set up. So um, that resource doesn't exist for us to use in the library beyond going into those sites, purchasing and downloading a copy, then printing it out, sticking it in a binder, and adding it to our collection. If you find yourself in a position of working with a music collection on a continual basis, getting involved with the Music Library Association is highly recommended. They're affiliated with ALA, but they're not part of ALA. They are a standalone organization. Now, when it comes to recorded music, we have, again, the three categories. And uh, we can get popular music. We get it through the same kinds of sources we would if we were purchasing for ourselves. We would go to Amazon. We would go to record stores, especially um, if you're working with independent labels, local music. Sometimes with local music, if you're building a collection of local music, you go to the bands or the performers themselves. But there's no real, really special place that you have to go to get popular music. There are vendors like Baker and Taylor. They have a collection development services that they offer. We can also get music, popular music in digital form through um, through platforms like Overdrive. Um, performance music, we can go to the same sources as popular music. You can usually find just about anything on Amazon. Um, but you also may be looking for more specialized sources like box sets or special release box sets or um, materials that, are, that were produced in Europe 
So you don't necessarily want to deal with exchanges and stuff like that. So you may want to go through um, either one of your vendors that deals with overseas publishers, or you can go to some of these sites, um, Alliance of Independent Media Stores. These are um, mostly independent publishers of music, independent record labels, and where they're located. And this is a source that you can go to to purchase those kinds of materials as well. Um, we turn a lot to independent bookstores when we're looking for some very specialized printed material. So it makes sense to turn to independent publishers and independent record labels um, to get music materials. As I said, you, you may even want to just turn to the performers themselves to see if you, can, if you can get copies of their CDs or copies of their music. Streaming music, again, we could go through platforms like Overdrive to get performance music and, and serious classical music that's of interest to, um, to people who are professions in the field. If you need a heavier emphasis on classical music, jazz, things that tend to be the objects of research study, uh, databases like Naxos are very good. You can look at whole albums as well as individual works. Keep in mind that if you're serious about music, these databases, they're compressed files. Okay, there is data loss in the music files. MP3s are, co are compressed files. That's why they're finding that vinyl actually sounds better than an MP3, because in order to get it to stream over our current infrastructure, they have to compress those files. So there is data loss. You can still pull out the old vinyl, stick a diamond head needle, run it through some good speakers, and actually get better sound. So whether uh, a database like Naxos or using the original vinyl is important depends on what your users need. You know, if they're looking at things like production qualities of music, you know, they're going to need to hear everything. Uh, and a compressed file might not cut it. Like other streaming media, uh, copyright is not, or music is not subject to the copyright exceptions granted to libraries, so any kind of digital rights management for uh, recorded music is going to be in effect too. Uh, you know, explain to the users that this was, will disappear after a week. It'll disappear from, regardless of what media uh, you're downloading in or where you're storing it. When it comes to providing access, in some libraries you'll find access to music is just like access to any other kind of material. It depends on the physical format of it. In other libraries, you'll find that access to music is like access to archival materials. It's not publicly accessible. Found music tends to be publicly accessible. And if, you're, if you don't believe me, go over to the music library. Last time I was over there, they were floor to ceiling. Individual parts, which are not bound, they are, you know, they're going to be performance parts for a quintet. You can't very well bind all five parts together because then your quintet, they're all going to be looking at one piece of music. So those are usually loose, kept in preservation folders. Sometimes each part is, is put in its own folder and they're kept, they're stored together. Depending on, on the individual work, that will depend on whether that music circulates or not. Large, sometimes you'll have boxes, you know, it'll be an orchestral work, and so it's got parts for everyone in the orchestra. So those loose parts come in boxes. And it's really hard if you circulate that. You've got to make sure every piece is there when you get it back. So, um, songbooks, compilations of different works, they tend to be shelves with scores or with regular books. They may be hardcover, they may be softcover, but they usually circulate. And you should also make devices uh, available in your collection for copying or scanning, especially with stuff that you won't allow to circulate. They can use it in-house, but they can't take it out of the library. With recorded music, um, the more durable formats usually circulate, things like CDs. Rare and fragile materials like uh, wax cylinders or wire recordings or metal discs, things that are very old, even some magnetic tape, some reel-to-reel -reel tape, some cassette tapes, 
depending upon their condition. If they were stored in a heated room and the tape all melted into one big blob, that's not going to circulate because it's only got one play left on it and you want that to be when you take that tape and migrate it to another format. You send that to a conservator and a professional to do that. But things like CDs, um, records, a lot of uh, music collections still have uh, sizable vinyl collections because they're out of print and there hasn't been a CD version created. Still has 78s or some early jazz and blues and it's really kind of cool. In some instances that's all you have. You have that copy of a particular work and there, there is, has been no format migration to, to uh, a newer format like CD. Um, formats should be current based on your user needs. If you're dealing with popular music, don't keep a whole big collection of cassette tapes around because nobody uses them. And there may even come a time when people don't use CDs anymore for popular music. They focus strictly on streaming media. And you're seeing over the past five years, especially as platforms like Overdrive started offering streaming media, that yeah, a lot of people are turning to that. The disadvantage, you know, from the user's perspective is that CD I can burn a copy of. Mm, streaming media disappears. Now, the, the big um, challenge to you as, as a person who's in charge of a collection like this, especially a popular collection, is keeping aware of the formats that are out there uh, and keeping up to date with your users on what performance, what, what formats they prefer, while at the same time considering that, okay, um, the kids may think that MP3s are the greatest thing in the world, but you may still have a sizable user population that likes the CDs. And any format that you have in your collection, with the exception of maybe something like a wax cylinder, you should have some sort of device that will allow a user to, at the very least, listen to that uh, uh, music or that uh, recording in-house. Now with um, digital and streaming media, obviously, in order to provide access, you've got to have the infrastructure. You've got to have a user-friendly interface for users to go in and download that music, download that re uh, recording, download um, an entire album, uh, you know, a Broadway show, if that's what they want to do. Um, but you also have to provide, um, not only provide for access, but restrict access, depending upon um, the license restrictions that are imposed upon you, usually through that vendor. Um, in the case of OverDrive, they have their own DRM software that makes that file disappear after a certain amount of time. But also, they require that only your users be able to get into that resource. So only your library uh, card holders, only the students and faculty at your institution. So you have to have some way of uh, regulating people's access to, um, to that resource in the first place. So if you try to get into Naxos through UB's uh, catalog, you have to authenticate first because only UB students, staff, and faculty are allowed into Naxos. We only pay a subscription for those users. General public wouldn't be able to do that. I think they could if they came in and used a computer on campus. But the license restrictions, as we talked about when we talked about licenses, um, that tells you what you can and cannot do. And you want to make sure that you have the IT infrastructure to govern that. You need a proxy server with authentication software. Or you need the IT mechanism using platforms that are provided by the vendors and by the sellers. You also need to keep control of your locally digitized music. For instance, stuff that's in the archives, recent performances, not so much stuff from 75 years ago, but recent performances that come out of the School of Music. That copyright is held by the music department. So they can't just digitize those performances and stick them up online without copyright permission from the music department. Even though the music library or the music archives owns it, 
it's as Amy Vils talked about, you can own the material but not st and still not have the copyright on it. So if you decide to digitize materials, they could be photographs in your music collection, photographs from performances, photographs of plays or ballets or operas. You have to make sure before you stick them out there for everyone to see online that you have the copyright clearance to do that, that you have the right to do that. You may decide to make digital copies, especially of older things, to provide in-house use, uh, as we do over in the archives with some resources, but users have to come to the library and use them on a specific computer. They cannot, you know, the general public cannot access. Other collections are public domain, and therefore the general public could come in through a web search and search some of those collections. So you have to have the infrastructure to be able to provide access and, in some cases, restrict access to the locally owned collections. Now when it comes to storage and preservation, obviously unbound materials, scores, ensemble collections have to have some sort of container that protects them because you've got to store them on a shelf, you've got to store them somewhere. They usually involve archival folders, uh, folders that are made of acid-free materials, neutral pH, so it doesn't uh, harm the music. Usually there are boxes then that folders are stored in, not always. It depends on your collection, depends on how much you have it, of it, okay? But you have to keep that in mind. You've got to have, if you're going to collect unbound materials, you've got to have some way to store them. And then you also need accommodations for limited access. Um, I know that with scores and loose material at the music library here, that's all in controlled circulation. You go to the desk, you ask, um, the student at the desk or the staff member at the desk to retrieve that score, to retrieve that music for you. Uh, the bound materials are all out on the shelf. And then they have their treasure room, which is their rare materials, and you don't get any kind of access to that room without a staff member present, because <laughs> uh, they've got some pretty rare materials in there. Bound materials, as I said, same considerations for other as, as for other print materials. They're usually bound with Buckram, you know, that ugly library binding. When you decide how you're going to bind something, you may elect to go with a spiral binding instead of traditional buckram. This might be a consideration, say, for a full score because the conductor has to be able to easily move the pages as they move on performers as well. And buckram is a little tough. It tends to close on itself especially when there are only a few pages in there. You also may need some significant space for oversized materials. Scores can be quite large. And so you may have to have special areas. Or you may decide that your, your shelf spacing is not going to be what we traditionally find in a library. And then digital sheet music and infrastructure for providing an access to and printing your digitized local collections. And of course, you would need archival backup of those files. Backup, backup, backup. With recorded music, CDs and vinyl, that's what most of us are used to dealing with. Plastic jewel cases tend to be the most durable, especially for circulating collections. You know, you have the clear plastic that comes on the ones that you get from the store. Um, Gaylord produces a, a cheaper kind of plastic, much lighter weight. And you can buy, and you can buy like ten for a buck. So um, a lot of libraries elect to get rid of the jewel, the jewel cases that come with the product, and use these thinner plastic jewel cases because they don't take up as much space. You need shelving for your vinyl records. You need cabinets for your CDs. You probably want rollout cabinets, like microform cabinets. So you need something that's going to be easy for users to navigate through. Temperature and humidity control, uh, it is important with vinyl. Water can damage CDs. Heat can damage CDs. If you're familiar with the construction of a CD, it's made up of five layers that are compressed upon one another, and in the wrong condition, those layers will split apart. So environmental conditions, they're not really special kinds of conditions beyond what you would find comfortable to work in. 
Of course, vinyl, you need to have some sort of jacket, some sort of sleeve that records are kept in. And you need to keep an eye on them for scratches. Scratches that don't follow the grooves, scratches that <laughs> are on the opposite way of the grooves. Oh yeah, um, vinyl, you have to be careful with any kind of paper container because although mold won't grow on the vinyl, it'll grow on the paper. Mold and mildew, so you want to be careful of that. Sound recording material, it can be easily damaged. And most of that damage comes from use. You know, if it's popular material, it gets used a lot. I mean, that's a great thing, but keep in, you've got to keep up with the use. Um, if somebody returns it and says, you know, this skips, then you're probably going to need to look at replacing. Rare and fragile materials would definitely need environmental conditions that are specific to that format. Wax cylinders grow mold beautifully, mold and uh, mildew, so you need to keep them in dry areas. And as I mentioned with the um, magnetic tape, sometimes you, you may not allow uh, access to any of those materials because they are in such a state that um, they can't be used until some sort of format, format migration or conservation occurs. With digital music, same with any kind of digital collection. You've got to have the infrastructure and the space for storing the collections, keeping them organized in a manner that you can retrieve them. Uh, including archival backup. And then as with legacy access to ebooks and e-journals, does your license allow for perpetual access? Or is it strictly only when you're currently subscribed to these materials? With regard to sheet music, again, the same issues that we run into with recorded material. Archival backup. I think the most important is really the IT infrastructure and the people with IT expertise. Recorded music, the same. I'm going to finish up with just some special uh, considerations you have to make should you find yourself overseeing rare materials, or maybe if you're uh, in a really fun place, uh, acquiring new rare materials. You know, here's uh, 3.5 million. Go out and bid on that uh, Bob Dylan manuscript for like a Rolling Stone that Sotheby's has got up at an auction. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, there aren't too many libraries that can afford to do that. Uh, those kinds of things usually go to private collectors or museums or things like that. But um, proactively building on your collection, it's the same as we talked about with archives. Depends on what you have, depends on your mission, and depends on what your users want. Are we going to stick with just providing access to what we have, or are we going to go out and seek new materials to add to this collection? If you have a music department in your college, and you need to keep up to date on new releases, you're going to go out and proactively build on that collection. But if you have some 16th century manuscripts that just happen to come from a donor and you don't have a really big collection and you don't have a, a department that focuses on you know, historical research on manuscripts, then that wouldn't be uh, feasible. It really wouldn't be something that you would put any kind of priority on. So your funding and your mission. Now, if somebody decides to make a new donation of manuscripts to you, will you turn them down? Well, not necessarily. But what do you have to consider if you're going to take on a, a 16th century manuscript? Security, preservation, environmental conditions, storage. How are you going to provide for access? just as you would with any other kind of rare material. Acquisition, like archives, they can come from a number, number of sources, auctions, rare materials dealers, eBay, believe it or not. Though you always take a chance when you buy something from eBay as to whether it's real or not. Independent sellers, as with archives, independent sellers and specialists are, are people that you turn to. You, again, you can use their knowledge to your advantage. Access, as with other special collections, you've got usually got restricted access and sometimes no access at all, depending upon the condition of the physical objects. And often we create or digitize materials to provide access that we otherwise wouldn't be able to provide because the materials are so brittle or the materials are in such bad condition that we create digital surrogates that people can use instead of handling the physical manuscript or handi handling the physical wax cylinder. We've had it 
converted into digital format so you can listen to it. If you want to hear some wax cylinders, uh, American Memory Project through the Library of Congress in their sound recording archives has some. They've digitized. Not a whole lot to listen to. There's a whole lot of scratchiness going on. But at the same time, when you consider that grooves are being cut into a piece of wax, it's pretty amazing when you think about it. Storage and preservation, again, uh, this is where the format really has a bearing on, on what it is that you need to be able to provide. You need to be aware not only of what the format requires, but the state of decay that it's presently in. You need to know enough about that format, and this may mean making a call to the Northeast Documentation Center um, or to a conservator and asking them to evaluate the condition before you decide if you're going to accept or if you're going to take on a collection like that. Because if it, has, if it requires a lot of conservation work in order to be used and you don't have the kind of money or the facilities to do that, it may not be a good idea to take that, but instead to suggest to the donor to give it to a, a, a repository that uh, would be able to do that. Now, if the donor was willing to fund the preservation work, in addition, then hey, bring it on. So here are some examples of some real collections. This is the Milton Rogovin photos that we have in the Music Library collection. These are available through the digital collections. Photos of storefront churches, uh, probably 40s and 50s. And he went all over the country doing this, but we have the ones that are related specifically to Buffalo a collection of rock posters and other ephemera at a public library, um, Christchurch City Library in New Zealand. Um, we actually have a rock or a, a music poster collection in our own music library, which is really kind of interesting. They've got a lot on display throughout the library, but they also have in their archives um, a huge collection of posters, primarily um, classical performances and music festivals, but also some rock posters and things in there. Um, this is the historic sheet music collection at Duke University. And here's, you know, here's an example of the kind of cover art, very colorful kinds of things. When I said oversized, I wasn't kidding. Um, sometimes needing to provide for oversized pieces. That's uh, uh, manuscripts of um, Gregorian chants. And then some 16th century musical texts at the University of Edinburgh. I know that we've got a few things like that in our treasure room as well. Um, and they're just very, very cool to look at. Because you think, I mean, this is before the printing press. All of these are hand illuminated. The musical notation is all um, hand printed. Other kinds of things that you'll find in music collections, you've got, as I said, the wax cylinders, which are extremely fragile. If you drop them, they will break. These are picture records. This isn't the label from the record. The whole thing is a record, and these were quite popular in the 40s. Florida Atlantic University has gone out of its way to try to collect as many of these from around the country to build a collection of these different picture records. And with each of these images, they include in their digitized site a, a, a bit of the music from it. If you go into these slides um, and run the slideshow, I have links to all these different collections, so you can take a look at them if you'd like. These are piano rolls, and there are still are producers of piano rolls. In fact, I believe there's a company here in Buffalo that's one of the few in the world that still produces piano rolls. And if you're not familiar with a piano roll, you put it in the piano and, and play the song, so you didn't need a person to actually sit at the piano and play it. This is what can happen to vinyl over time. These are 78 RPM discs, and they're undergoing restoration and conservation treatment at um, Syracuse. And then you may actually have collections of instruments in your music library or in your music collection. So you never, I mean, you can find all kinds of things. In, in music special collections, they're just like every other kind of special collection. Anything related to music. So you can find some pretty cool stuff in there. And that's all I got. I know this was probably a little bit more in-depth treatment than most of you expected, but again, the whole purpose, was, though you would probably likely be dealing with popular collections, you may find yourself in a position to, oh, wow, that's a wax cylinder. <laughs> 
I got to talk to somebody about this. You know, it was in the bottom of the box underneath all of the Harlequin romances. And, oh, you know, and then you find it. It's one of a kind. Nobody else in the world has it. Uh, hello, Library of Congress. How much will you give us for it? <laughs> okay.